for many Protestants, the orthodox use of icons is the second most controversial element of the orthodox faith, coming right after our love for Jesus' mother, Mary. This controversy is not about the images themselves, because Protestants have their own favorite painted and cinematic depictions of Jesus. What they object to is the fact that we venerate icons by bowing before them, kissing them, and lighting candles. But we can start out by agreeing on at least one thing. Christians have been painting pictures of Jesus and the people and the events of the Bible from very nearly the beginning. Maybe you've seen reproductions of the wall paintings from the Roman catacombs, like this Good Shepherd from the early 200s. And here's the earliest Madonna and Child, also early 200s. It shows Mary nursing the baby Jesus, but both of them have already lifted their heads to look at us as we draw near. I think that's just ingenious that you're in this dark catacomb, you've got a light, a lamp or something, and you're making your way forward, and oh, there's a picture over there, let's go look at it. And as you walk up, you realize they're already looking at you. So there's, um, I guess, some spiritual truth about that, of course. The Lord is already looking at us. In this image, um, you see there's a prophet standing beside her. That's Balaam, and he's pointing to the star. And this comes from the prophecy in Numbers 24, 17. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star shall come forth from Jacob, and a scepter shall rise from Israel. Now, today, we look at this, we immediately recognize that it's a Madonna and child. But back then, viewers wouldn't necessarily know who these people were. And so the artist placed the prophet there to point to the star and to tip us off. In 1963, an English farmer plowing his field discovered a room-sized mosaic of Christ. It was probably part of the floor of a Roman villa, and it dates to about 270. Now, you may well ask, how do we know that this is a depiction of Christ? Because of that emblem behind his head, which looks like an X with a P over it, that's called a Cairo, and it's a Greek monogram for Christ. Now, this doesn't look anything like our middle image of what Jesus looks like. These early British Christians didn't know what he looked like, but they loved him. And so they depicted him as a handsome and powerful man, a magnificent hero, a Hercules. That's what Jesus was to them. Maybe there are other paintings and mosaics that haven't been discovered yet. I hope so. But icons that were painted on perishable materials, like wood or canvas, wouldn't be likely to survive for a couple of thousand years. There are probably many, many icons that were made that are missing. And there's another reason we don't have a lot of icons from before the 7th century. It's because they were intentionally destroyed. But we'll get to that later. The most interesting site when you're talking about early Christian images is the lost city of Dura Europus. This was a Roman army town in what is now Syria on the far eastern edge of the Roman Empire. It was wildly diverse. Inscriptions have been found in Greek, Latin, Middle Persian, Parthian, Hebrew, Sephaitic, and Aramaic, both Palmyrene and Syriac. Dura Europus had temples to over a dozen different gods. The city was situated at an ideal spot on the Euphrates River, and for that reason, it changed hands many times. But that came to an end 
in the year 256, when Persian soldiers tunneled under the wall and captured the city. But then they walked away and left it abandoned. Centuries passed, many, many centuries passed. Sand covered the ruins more and more until the site was completely buried. But in 1920, soldiers digging a trench were surprised to come upon a wall painting. And so archeologists were called in and they gradually uncovered a city preserved just as it was in 256. This was an extremely significant archeological finding, as you can imagine. They called it the Pompeii of the Desert. The most surprising of the city's temples was a synagogue because its walls were completely covered with paintings of Old Testament characters and scenes. These paintings, still vividly colored, show Abraham, Moses, Elijah, Esther, the sacrifice of Isaac, the parting of the Red Sea, and much more. One of my favorites is the portrait of Abraham, just to the upper left of the Torah shrine. The images ascend the wall in several registers, just like you'd see in an Orthodox church today. Here is Pharaoh's daughter finding baby Moses in the river. Notice that the story is told sequentially, like a graphic novel. We see her lifting up baby Moses from the river, and then we see the women on the riverbank taking him up into their arms. Notice, too, that the story runs from right to left, like the Hebrew language. But, you may ask, how can there be all these paintings when the Ten Commandments clearly forbid the making of idols. When King Herod set the golden eagle of Rome over the temple gate, the Jews were so outraged that they chopped it down with axes, even though they knew the penalty was going to be a gruesome death. But less than 200 years later, here we are in a synagogue completely covered with images. How can that be? Hold that thought. Just a few doors down from the synagogue, archaeologists found a Christian house church. It had been a family home and was converted into a church in the earlier 200s. This building wasn't as well preserved. And some of the paintings were pretty badly made. They're not nearly as good as the synagogue paintings. And yet, they include the earliest depictions of Jesus that have yet been found. Here's the room set aside for baptisms. And you can see on the, a niche with the font, and then above it, in that half circle, is an image of Christ the Good Shepherd. On the lower right, larger and more visible, are the myrrh-bearing women approaching the tomb, or perhaps they are the five wise virgins approaching the wedding banquet. Behind them on an adjoining wall, all that remains are five pairs of feet. Above these charming ladies is a depiction on the left of Christ healing the paralytic. Note that this also reads from right to left. The image beside it shows Jesus walking on the water and pulling up Peter as he begins to sink. These paintings look quite primitive compared with the paintings on the synagogue walls. Maybe this small church didn't have a good artist in the congregation, and somebody just sketched these in as a placeholder. But why did Jews and Christians start using visual arts in their temples? As they came into the wider Greco-Roman world, they encountered a culture that could enjoy the beauty of paintings without worshiping them. A painting could be an image uh, in Greek, icon, E-I-K-O-N. We are made in the icon of God, Genesis 1.27. An image could be an icon without being an idol, Greek, Eidolon, E-I-D-O-L-O-N. 
the pagans had idols, of course, plenty of them, but not every image was an idol. A painting could be inspiring, instructive, entertaining, or just beautiful without being an object of worship. Let's focus on that for a minute because that's where the trouble always starts. It's when people can't tell a difference between cherishing or honoring something and worshiping it. We understand it well enough when it comes to the flag. We want the American flag to be handled respectfully, but we don't think that amounts to worshiping the flag. It's honor, not worship. A photo of somebody you love might deserve a fancy frame and a prime place on the wall, but you're honoring that someone, you're not worshiping him. So how can you tell the difference? What's the difference between honor and worship? It's easy. One word. Sacrifices. If you make a sacrifice to a man-made object, you are worshiping an idol. If you're in the city market and you bow to a Roman senator as he goes by, you're just making the customary gesture of respect. You aren't giving him a sacrifice. If you curtsy to the Queen of England, you are honoring her, not worshiping her. If the bailiff says, all rise, and you stand up, you are honoring the judge. You are not worshiping him. An icon is an icon. An idolon is an idol. A painting of Christ could be an icon without being an idol. And to tell the truth, painted images gave the early Christians a wonderful resource, a new way to communicate the scriptures. People usually encountered the scriptures when they heard them read aloud during worship. And you may ask, well, why weren't they reading the Bible for themselves? <laughs> for one thing, illiteracy was widespread for many, many centuries. But also, all Bibles, all books, had to be lettered by hand. The first print Bible didn't appear until 1555. All that labor-intensive work made them prohibitively expensive. Think what it would cost you today if you hired a calligrapher to make you a copy of the Bible. So these Christians encountered the scriptures through hearing them read aloud. And to help with comprehension and retention, these readings were surrounded by sermons, homilies, chants, and hymns that explained and supported the theme. If today's Orthodox worship is any kind, the general rule seemed to be put it to music and sing it three times. Well, if you're trying to get a spoken text into the memories of your hearers, then repetition and melody are good tools. But everything was still being delivered only to the ears. And sound is the most fleeting of sensory signals. As soon as a word is spoken, it is gone. Wall paintings offered a whole new way to present the people and the events of the Bible. Unlike sound, images were stable. They would always be there, available to believers at any time. Now, imagine that a woman goes into the church of Dura Europus one afternoon. The service that she attends on Sundays is a multi-sensory experience, supplying sound, sight, fragrance, touch, and taste. Today, when she steps inside the building, she smells the lingering incense, and all those memories resound. As her eyes adjust to the dim light, she starts to see the familiar icons. The images of Jesus are scratchy and minimal, but they have become for her a visual anchor. When she hears the gospel stories read aloud every Sunday, this is the Jesus she pictures doing these things. She doesn't have to come to the church to pray. She could pray anywhere, everywhere. 
she probably does. But she has come to the church today on purpose because looking at the picture of Jesus helps her concentrate. As she walks toward her favorite icon, everything inside her, her whole attention is gathering together, focusing on the Lord. She lights a nearby lamp and his face, so beloved, blooms out of the darkness, the face of her only hope, the Lord Jesus Christ. As she looks at him, her eyes fill with tears. She begins speaking to Jesus in her heart, her thoughts overflowing spontaneously. She's worried about her little grandson, who is very sick. He may die. As she prays, she sometimes leans forward and rests her forehead on the image. Sometimes she murmurs aloud, please, please, please. Sometimes she looks Jesus right in the eye, and sometimes she looks away, overcome by sorrow. Sometimes as she implores Jesus' help, she kisses his hand. At the end, she bows before the image as she would bow to a magistrate or governor. She kisses Jesus' hand one more time before she goes. If you want to understand what Orthodox Christians are doing in front of an icon, you really should just ask us. <laughs> we'll tell you. It's not a secret. What we do in front of an icon is the very same thing the old woman is doing here, as she gazes at Christ's face, imploring him aloud and silently. It's in the way she bows before the image, the way she gives it a kiss. All this is a natural expression of what she is feeling. Her worries and her helplessness and her yearning, it's all pouring out of her spontaneously in a natural way. A picture of someone we love affects us that way. Spoken words can be very powerful, but an image of a face reaches us in a completely different way. God designed us that way, designed us to seek out faces, to look for faces. In an experiment, scientists showed newborn babies just 18 hours old pairs of geometric images, like the baby sitting up in a car seat, and they show it a square and a circle. And then they would look to see which one the baby's eyes would gravitate toward, which ones did the babies prefer to look at. And they found that if one of the options was an oval with two dots near the top, the most rudimentary possible depiction of a human face, babies would choose it, even though they'd never seen a face before. Well, let's change the scene and update it a little bit. Imagine a soldier in wartime looking at a photo of his wife. He is swept with love and longing. He speaks to her in his heart. He knows he's not talking to the photo. <laughs> the photo is something that helps him, opens him so that he can speak to her. He kisses the photo. He doesn't think the photo is her, <laughs> but he handles it carefully, keeps it safe. He cherishes it because it's a photo of his wife. And you might say to him, what's the big deal? It's just a piece of paper. It has some ink on it. But this particular piece of paper, on this paper, a minuscule amount of ink has been arranged so that it shows the face that he loves. And for that reason, he cherishes it. A picture of a person is not the same thing as the person. But it's not nothing either. 
over all these centuries, Orthodox Christians have been bowing and kissing not only icons, but the cross and the Bible as well. We do this to express love, give honor, demonstrate our commitment. This is an ancient way of doing those things, and Orthodox have simply never stopped doing it. Everybody enters a pre-existing Orthodox community and does what the community is already doing. Century follows century, and here we are. We're still doing the same thing. When my children were small, we were evangelical Protestants. We knew nothing about Orthodoxy. We would have scoffed at icons. And yet, when my son was about two years old, I bought him a picture of Jesus, a printed image laminated onto a wooden plaque. Basically, an icon. Here it is. Every night we talked about Jesus. We heard some of the Bible, we prayed, and we finished by kissing the picture. Although we were evangelicals, we were kissing a picture of Jesus. And it never occurred to us that there might be anything wrong with that. We knew we weren't worshiping the image, the paper and the ink. It was Jesus we loved. And when we looked at this picture, it made our hearts go out to him. We loved that picture. We took care of it. We treated it with honor. We put it up on the bookshelf as a reminder that Jesus himself was watching over us as we slept. Icons are Bible illustrations, like the pictures in a children's Bible. When most Christians were illiterate, icons made the Bible visible. Icons helped missionaries bring the faith to new lands where verbal communication might be difficult. Images can communicate where a written text cannot. All you have to do is look. As is often said, icons are windows into heaven. You don't stop at the window, you go through it. That picture of Jesus certainly functioned as a window into heaven for my two-year-old son and me. It might be that you find it hard to like icons because the style is so foreign and strange. Um, that was how I felt. I just didn't like the look of them. But if that's the case, there are scores and probably hundreds of contemporary pictures of Jesus on the internet. People buy these pictures because they love Jesus and they want to see his face. These same websites sell plaques with Bible verses written on them, and people buy those too. But pictures and words address different corners of our minds, and they have different kinds of communicative power, and so people like to have both. And that's why the early church used both, because they complement each other. As in the old proverb, a picture is worth a thousand words. Any questions? But the early church didn't venerate icons. In the early centuries, Christians said, we don't make images of the Most High God. And then in the seventh century, people started venerating icons because now there's suddenly a big uproar about it. So venerating icons is a direct contradiction of the beliefs of the early church. Hmm, this is a bit of a bait and switch, isn't it? Because you're comparing the first century with the seventh century. Very different things were happening then in the early church and in the seventh century. In the early centuries, Christians were up against people who worshiped man-made images. In the seventh century, Christians were up against people who hated man-made images. These required different responses. In the early centuries, Roman pagans were killing believers because they refused to sacrifice to idols. Christians proclaimed that they did not make images of the Most High God. 
In fact, the foremost defender of icons, St. John of Damascus, who lived 675 to 749. St. John of Damascus affirms this and says, It is impossible to make an image of God who is a pure spirit, invisible, boundless, having neither form nor circumscription. How can we make an image of that which is invisible? And Orthodox still don't make images of the Most High God. We never have. But in the mid to late seventh century, veneration of icons suddenly became very controversial. Now, can you think of anything that happened in the early seventh century? Right, Islam swept out of the desert, slaying Christians, conquering Christian cities. Jerusalem itself fell early in 638. But this time, it wasn't pagans commanding believers to worship images. It was Muslims who hated images of any kind. And as Christian cities fell to Muslim invaders, some of the leaders of the Byzantine Empire wondered if these attackers might be right. Maybe God was allowing the Muslims to have these bloody victories because icons actually were an offense to him. In 730, Emperor Leo III ordered that all icons should be seized and destroyed. Iconoclasm, which means icon smashing. Iconoclasm became official public policy. Icons were crushed, burned, painted over, and covered with plaster. During the years that icon defenders were being rounded up and executed, a monk named Stephen was arrested. They placed an icon of Christ on the floor and commanded Stephen to put his foot on Christ's face. That was how he could prove that an icon was just wood and paint and not Christ himself. Now, the iconoclasts were Christians, too. They had just become convinced that it was idolatry to make any sort of an image of Jesus. They had lost the distinction between honor and worship. So they commanded Stephen to put his foot on the face of Christ. Could you do that? I mean, picture that. But instead, Stephen took a coin that showed the face of the emperor. And he put the coin on the floor. And then he put his foot on the emperor's face. And he was immediately executed. <laughs> Because even iconoclasts know there's a connection between an image of a person and the person himself. Honor shown to the emperor's image is honor shown to the emperor. Disrespect to the image is disrespect to the man. We know this. We already know this. It's instinctive. The restoration of icons came in 843 when Empress Saint Theodora, with a host of clergy and people, carried icons through the streets of Constantinople and returned them to their proper places. Orthodox Christians still make an icon procession every year on the first Sunday in Great Lent, and uh, you're welcome to come and see, see how we treat icons. The Byzantine Empire destroyed icons vigorously for over a century. And that's one reason icons made before the 8th century are so rare. The ones that survived were in places far beyond the empire's reach, like Mount Sinai and Rome. You've probably seen this icon called the Christ of Sinai, which was painted around 550. It's been a companion in worship at the Orthodox monastery on, on Mount Sinai for 1,500 years. But Byzantine iconoclasm only lasted for 100 years. The Muslim conquerors of those eastern lands have continued to deface and destroy icons even till today. Christians at this church can no longer bow and kiss this image, but they leave roses. 
Is it wrong to leave roses on an icon? So Orthodox don't make images of the Most High God, and we never have. But we do make images of those things which God has chosen to make visible. And that is emphatically the case with our Lord Jesus Christ, because becoming visible was essential for our salvation. In becoming human, God broke into history in a way that was deliberately tangible and visible. As 1 John 1.1 1, 1 insists, that which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at, and our hands have touched, this we proclaim. And St. Paul says that Christ is the icon of the invisible God, Colossians 1.15. When we make an icon of Jesus, we are declaring and defending the truth of the Incarnation. St. John of Damascus wrote, Of old, God the incorporeal and uncircumscribed was never depicted. Now, however, when God is seen clothed in flesh and conversing with men, I make an image of the God whom I see. I do not worship matter. I worship the God of matter, who became matter for my sake, and deigned to inhabit matter, who worked out my salvation through matter. And St. John emphasizes it's not the matter itself that we're venerating, but the person whose image it bears. If wood has been made into a cross, he says he will honor it and kiss it. But if it's just two pieces of wood, he says, I throw them in the fire and burn them. The charge leveled at us earlier was that the early Christians did not venerate icons. The veneration only began in the seventh century. But St. John of Damascus quotes a multitude of early church figures in his defense of icons. Certainly the veneration of icons became a big controversy in the seventh century. But that doesn't mean that previously people weren't venerating icons. It means that venerating icons was not controversial. Venerating icons wasn't a problem until the Islamic conquest made it so. For who could claim that people weren't greeting icons reverently and affectionately all along? If someone had a piercing prayer need, he would surely go into a church and stand before an icon and consider that an excellent place to cry out for help. People must have been praying in front of icons, bowing before them, kissing them, wherever there were churches, wherever there were icons, from whenever icon-making began. People want to express affection and respect toward the pictures of people they love. How are you going to stop them? Any other questions? Well, why do Orthodox say that icons are the equal of the Bible? Icons are not the equal of the Bible. Icons are the mirror of the Bible. To the extent that they reflect it well, that they reflect it accurately, then they are trustworthy, and they accurately convey what the Bible says. That's the reason why icons don't change very much over the centuries. Any icon of the same subject from any century, from any culture, is going to show the same people arranged in the same way. An icon takes its place in the procession of icons over the centuries, all over the world, all faithfully depicting the same people and events. But icons do have this limitation. Even though a good, faithful icon can depict what the Bible says, it can only do so up to a point. An image is necessarily much less detailed than a text. An icon can show Jesus meeting the woman at the well, but it can't depict what they said to each other. There can be an icon of St. Paul, but not an icon of the epistle to the Galatians. So here we find the opposite of the proverb. 
A text is worth a thousand pictures. Compared with the written word of God, icons are far less rich. And so the early church wisely made use of both. But the bowing, well, it's biblical, you know? <laughs> when scripture says they fell on their faces, it means they made a prostration with their foreheads to the ground. That's what the disciples did at the transfiguration. But sometimes to honor someone, you just make a bow as Joseph's brothers bowed and gave proskinesis to him. There's a whole spectrum of ways to give honor, from a full prostration to just bowing the head. We Orthodox just never stop doing it. In the presence of great holiness, it's pretty much the instinctive thing to do, to fall on your face before it. And the kissing. It's just a kissier culture. Christianity isn't native to Europe, you know. It began in the Middle East, technically in Asia, and immediately started spreading in all directions at once, spreading to the east and the south in addition to the north and the west. Many Christians to the south and east of us expect to kiss and embrace when they meet. Why do you light candles in front of icons? Why do you light candles on your dinner table? Well, it just looks nice. A light on the table attracts the diners, it draws them together, it shines on the plates and the glasses and it lights up their faces. Well, a light bulb would do a better job. Why don't you put a lamp on the dinner table? It just looks nicer with candles. It's traditional. Not all traditions are dead, are they? Christmas traditions, for example, we keep those traditions willingly because we enjoy them. They bond the family together. They bring things to life. Until electricity was invented, people put candles on the table so they could see the food. When that was no longer necessary, we continued the tradition because we like it. A good tradition brings beauty and life. But what about miracle-working icons? Now you're not thinking them as just honored paintings. You think they've got some kind of spiritual power. Sometimes miracles just erupt from icons. It's not something we control. It's not even something we pray for. But once miracles are being manifested, then what are you going to do with an icon like that? We don't do anything different, actually. We still venerate the icon in the same way. But when something like that happens, we all go around looking kind of stunned. <laughs> And this brings us to something we haven't talked about so far, which is that Orthodox believe that God is everywhere present and filling all things, as one of the ancient prayers says. He is permeating all of his creation. The whole earth is full of his glory, Isaiah 6, 3. So there's no wall of separation between natural and supernatural. We could encounter God at any point he chooses. Some of us have found the Bible to be a place where we can have those encounters. God can work through an ordinary copy of the Bible to suddenly address his word directly to our hearts. A friend of mine joined our Orthodox Church over the objections of her adult daughter who insisted that icons are nothing but idols. And so one day Jeannie was caring for her granddaughter and the mother phoned from work. And after the little girl finished talking with her mother, she kissed the phone. And Jeannie then said to her daughter, do you think she was kissing the phone? There really is someone on the other end of the line. And sometimes that presence breaks through, whether it's a Bible or an icon. To return to an earlier analogy, if an icon is a window into heaven, 
then we do well to remember you can look through a window from both sides. The most common miracle I've seen concerning icons is when a kind of light, fragrant oil begins beating up on the painted surface. We call it myrrh. I've seen this happening myself. Father Mark Leisure is pastor of St. George Orthodox Church in Taylor, Pennsylvania. And a few years ago, an icon in his church began streaming myrrh. The flow is so strong that I've seen him take the icon and tip it and pour the sweet-smelling oil into the hands of children. I have seen the Hawaii Ivoron icon, which began streaming myrrh in a private home in Hawaii while lying flat on top of a tall bookcase. The family couldn't figure out where that fragrance of a thousand roses was coming from. But one day their cat walked in and stood up on his hind legs in front of the bookcase, sniffing. And that prompted them to get a stepladder and investigate. The Hawaii Ivron icon has been taken to churches all over the country. When it came to my church, it was in its shadow box with a fresh bed of cotton balls to absorb the constant myrrh. You can see the shiny, oily patches here on the surface of the icon. My husband places it on an icon stand. There I am. During worship that evening, the myrrh soaked through and the icon had to be lifted out so the cotton balls could be replaced. Everybody got some myrrh-soaked cotton to take home in a baggie. I saw drops of myrrh beating up on the underside of the glass. I have seen these things. I would guess there are about a dozen myrrh streaming icons in America. Miracles occur in their presence and also when people are anointed with the myrrh. Conversions take place as well. Father Mark Leisure can tell about a Muslim who came to the Wednesday night prayer service and loudly denounced the icon. And now he's a Christian believer and a member of the church. So I don't know if you're objecting to the way we treat such an icon, because actually we treat it just the same, or if you're objecting to our belief that a miracle happened, or that miracles continue to happen. Is it the miracles that are the problem? Nobody asks an icon to stream myrrh. Sometimes things like this just start happening with an icon. And then what are you going to do with it? Well, it still looks like worship to me. Okay, picture this. Say, a group of scientists from Mars visits a cemetery on Earth, and they see people coming up and laying flowers on the graves of their relatives. And one Martian says, these people think their ancestors can still smell these flowers. And the next one says, no, they're trying to elevate the rank of their ancestors. The ones who have flowers are more important than the ones who don't. And the third one says, no, they're trying to bribe their ancestors to stay in their graves and not come haunt them. And if you were there, you might say, look, you've got this completely wrong. This is not a ritual, it's not a magic formula or anything like that. It's simpler than that. It's just something people do to express their love for these relatives. You should come here for a while and just watch. Come and see. With time, you'll be able to understand why we do this and what it means to us.